This lecture is on autonomic regulation of blood pressure, and I will focus on the regulation of blood pressure by autonomic nerves and baroreflex mechanisms. This is an edited lecture from one that I gave to medical students in 2021. This lecture is based upon content found in my textbook, Cardiovascular Physiology Concepts, published by Walters Kluwer, and this is the third edition, published in 2021. Let's begin by looking at the anatomy of central and peripheral autonomic connections. Showing in this slide, here's a spinal cord. We have the medulla, we have the pons, we have hypothalamus, we have the cerebral cortex. And of course, the spinal cord is where we have for example, sympathetic efferents, nerves traveling from the brain to, let's say, the heart and, and blood vessels. The medulla is where things happen for the cardiovascular system. It is the location for the sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons that regulate heart and vascular function. And it is the medulla that receives input from afferent nerves that I'll talk about in, in this lecture. Unlike the pulmonary system, the pons really play no real important role in cardiovascular regulation. The hypothalamus, though, does play a role. The hypothalamus is a kind of an integrative center within the brain. For example, you can't stimulate discrete regions of the hypothalamus electrically and elicit complex cardiovascular responses, let's say mimicking exercise, because the hypothalamus has projections down to the medulla, and it can provide an integrated response from the medulla then out to the heart and to the systemic circulation. And of course, the cerebral cortex, just um, through emotional uh, changes, you know, excitement, anxiety, and so forth, can affect also then these lower brainstem regions and affect cardiovascular control. Now let's look at the parasympathetic and sympathetic efferent connections. A rather simplistic diagram, but one that helps us summarize what I think are the most important things that you need to know at, at this stage. Let's begin by looking at the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. That's a cholinergic branch be, uh, of the system because it releases acetylcholine as a, as a transmitter. And it's primarily the, the vagus nerve for the cardiovascular control. So vagus nerve or cranial nerve 10, it leaves the medulla and travels to the heart. And the preganglionic fibers for the parasympathetic nerves are rather long once they exit the medulla. And they travel all the way to the heart. And within the heart itself is where they have the ganglia. And postganglionic fibers then emanate from the ganglia and are rather short, and they're the actual fibers that will innervate different regions within the heart itself. In contrast, the sympathetic adrenergic system travels down the spinal cord, down to T1, where you have its first branch off, and also down to L2 in the lumbar region, and these branches of the sympathetic, you have sympathetic neurons here that will then go to with uh, via short preganglionic fibers to innervate along the, the paravertebral ganglia or the sympathetic chain ganglia. So you have various cervical ganglia and then you have the thoracic type of uh, sympathetic chain ganglia. And then you have postganglionic fibers that will then be longer fibers, so the preganglionic are short in contrast to the parasympathetic. Postganglionic fibers are long and they travel all the way to the heart. You also have prevertebral ganglia, uh, say like the celiac ganglia, superior mesenteric ganglia, and these ganglia also uh, will send, send postganglionic fibers primarily then to, to the blood vessels. So that's just a very general picture of the autonomic connections from the brain out to the uh, heart and circulation. But now what we wanna look at is the actual regulation of, of the heart and blood vessels by autonomic function. And so we're gonna begin by looking at the receptor level. And so if this is now the heart, looking at regulation of the heart, the heart is innervated by both sympathetic nerves, 
and by the vagus nerve. Now, let's look at the sympathetic nerve first. The sympathetic nerve fibers, when they are activated by the by the by their medullary neurons, they will release the transmitter norepinephrine. Norepinephrine will primarily bind to beta adrenergic receptors in the heart, and principally the beta one subtype of beta adrenergic receptor. So that's why the larger arrow going to the beta one receptor, but it also will bind to the beta two receptors. And the population of these two receptors can change under different conditions in the heart. It's somewhat dynamic, especially under pathologic conditions. The norepinephrine can also bind to alpha one receptors located on the cardiac uh, cells. And, but it, it has very little effect compared to the beta adrenergic system. But binding to any of these receptors will lead to an increase in chronotropy. That's a fancy word that we use for heart rate. Chrono meaning time, so heart rate and time. It also will stimulate dronotropy. Dronotropy has to do with the electrical conduction within the heart, conduction velocity of action potentials within the heart. And stimulation of these receptors will increase the inotropy, which is a fancy word that we use for contractility of the heart. On the other hand, if we look at the vagus side, the vagus nerves are cholinergic, so they will release acetylcholine from their postganglionic fibers. Acetylcholine will bind within the heart to primarily the M M2 type receptor, muc muscarinic type 2 receptors. And when acetylcholine binds to these receptors, it has the opposite effects of the sympathetics. It decreases chronotropy, dronotropy, and inotropy. Now, acetylcholine also has the ability, when it's released from the vagus nerves, to diffuse and to bind to pre-junctional M2 receptors on the sympathetic nerve terminals. And binding of acetylcholine to these pre-junctional receptors inhibits norepinephrine release. So if you activate both sympathetic and vagus nerves at the same time, well, the sympathetics are trying to activate the heart, but the vagus nerve can inhibit that activation. Maybe not shut it off entirely, but partially inhibit and attenuate the sympathetic effects by this prejunctional effect on M2 receptors. Uh, notice here, I also have, just for clarification for, for you, that norepinephrine can also bind to prejunctional alpha-2 receptors, which produces negative feedback inhibition of norepinephrine release. The sympathetic effects are primarily going throughout the heart. They're going to the S, what we call the SA node, the pacemaker side of the heart, the atrioventricular node, and to the atrial muscle and ventricular muscle to affect all these systems. Where the vagal effects primarily are going to the SA node and the AV node, and so they primarily affect heart rate and conduction through the AV node. And so vagal effects are rather weak in terms of ventricular effects of, on inotropy. A summary statement here that you need to keep in mind, because I'll be referring to this over and over again, activation of both, this, both systems, sympathetic and vagal nerves, you will find that the vagus activation will be dominant. They're dominant over sympathetic effects. And I'll address this again later. Now, what about the vasculature? So this is a blood vessel here, and this is the smooth muscle. Sympathetic nerves, when they are activated, release norepinephrine, and it binds largely in most vessels to alpha-1 adrenal receptors. There's also binding to alpha-2 adrenal receptors. And different, different um, types of vessels, art, artery versus vein, and different organs have different relative populations of alpha-1 and alpha-2 post-junctional receptors. Norepinephrine can also bind to the beta-2 receptors that are located on, on the blood vessels. Now, the alpha effect produces an increase in vascular tone. And what I mean by that is that it causes the smooth muscle to contract. And so you get vasoconstriction with that norepinephrine release. Beta-2 effects, on the other hand, would produce relaxation of the smooth muscle. But the dominant effect when you release the norepinephrine is indeed the vasoconstrictor effect, 
The basal dilator effect is kind of occurring in the background, but it is overwhelmed by the alpha mediated response. You know, the only way you can really see the beta 2 effect with norepinephrine is to block both the alpha 1 and alpha 2 receptors, and then norepinephrine will produce a weak basal dilation. In terms of parasympathetic nerves, you need to realize that, that there is relatively little parasympathetic innervation of blood vessels. They are found in a few specialized places within the body. For example, you have vagal efferents in, in tissues such as penile erectile tissue. And the release of the acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nerves binding to M3 receptors now, not M2, but M3 receptors will cause basal dilation or reduction in vascular tone. So that's important in penile erectile tissue. It's also important in some other places. There is vagal innervation of coronary vessels, although it's rather weak compared to um, what we call the metabolic regulation of coronary vascular tone. This table just summarizes the receptor-mediated actions um, on the heart. If the post-junctional receptor is a muscarinic receptor, we find that acetylcholine dep depresses the heart. It can nor normally causes dilation of blood vessels, but it can cause constriction under certain conditions because you have M3 receptors that are associated with endothelium that then cause the release of nitric oxide to cause dilation. Whereas smooth muscle, if you devoid it of the endothelium, you can get a contractile response with acetylcholine because the M3 receptors will produce a, a, that sort of response in the smooth muscle itself. Alpha-1 receptors cause weak stimulation of the heart but strong constriction of blood vessels. Alpha-2 causes constriction of blood vessels. Beta-1 receptors stimulate the heart, and very important to note, it causes renin release from the kidneys and activation of the angiotensin aldosterone system. Beta-2 receptor stimulation is weak on the heart, for it can produce dilation in blood vessels. And then another type of receptor that I did not already talk about is the D1 or the DA1 receptor. That's a dopaminergic type one receptor and that will cause renal dilation. And there are drugs that are used in the treatment of shock, for example, that will activate, will bind to the D1 receptor and cause um, renal dilation. So what are the overall responses of autonomic activation? Well, if you have generalized sympathetic activation in the body, activate sympathetic adrenergic nerves, Norepinephrine is the neurotransmitter. It's going to stimulate beta receptors in the heart and alpha receptors in blood vessels. And the response will be an increase in cardiac output, brought about largely by <clears throat> an increase in heart rate and also an increase in inotropy, largely. I mean, those, those two are the most important factors that will increase the cardiac output with sympathetic activation. And in terms of blood vessels, the alpha adrenergic activation will constrict the precapillary resistance vessels and cause an increase in SVR. Parasympathetic activation really only affects the heart in any real way. It doesn't, although it has effects in, in individual tissues of the body, as I mentioned earlier, those changes really do not affect systemic vascular resistance. They are too small, the chains are too small relative to the systemic vascular resistance. And when you think of parasympathetic control related to the heart, so mus muscarinic receptors binding acetylcholine causing a decrease in cardiac output caused by decreased heart rate. The key concept here at this point is that vagal stimulation of the heart is dominant over sympathetic stimulation. I've stated that a couple times now, so you know that's important, particularly in the heart rate responses. Therefore, vagal inhibition is necessary for heart rate to increase, which is exactly what happens during exercise. Your body naturally turns off vagal and turns on sympathetic. And 
without the vagal being turned off, the heart rate would not increase appropriately when you exercise. Another key concept here is that at rest, vagal tone predominantly affects heart rate, whereas sympathetic tone predominantly influences blood vessels. So vagal tone is responsible for low resting heart rates. And you can demonstrate that very, very simply by administering atropine, for example. If a person is administered atropine, suddenly the heart rate increases because your resting heart rate is low right now, perhaps you know in the 60s or 70s while you're listening to this lecture, unless you're really excited about this material and it might be in the 80s or something. But that's still lower than the intrinsic rate of firing of the heart of the SA node. And, but if you were to be administered atropine, your heart rate would suddenly jump up to 100 or 110 beats per minute, showing that you have vagal tone, and that's what keeps your heart rate down at a lower level at rest. Whereas in contrast, sympathetic tone is, re is responsible for maintaining vascular tone and normal arterial pressure. So even at rest, you have a certain amount of sympathetic tone on blood vessels, causing them to be partially constricted. And you can demonstrate that very easily by administering an alpha blocker. If you administer an alpha blocker, you suddenly cause vasodilation and it decreased arterial pressure because you're going to partially remove that sympathetic tone. What activates sympathetic nerves? Well, activated by increased physical activity, activated by stress. Sympath the uh, sympathetic system is activated during heart failure. And it's activated during shock, like circulatory shock, hemorrhagic shock, cardiogenic shock. All these are conditions that lead to an activation of sympathetic nerves and their responses. So now let's talk about baroreceptor reflexes. So in this diagram, I'm pointing out here, here's, this is the aortic arch. This is the, um, the right common carotid artery, the left common carotid artery. I'm not showing the subclavian here. But if you look, if you go up the, the um, common carotid artery to the bifurcation of the internal and the external artery, of course, high up here on the neck, on the internal artery in the wall, we have stretch receptors that are located. And the very fact that they are stretch receptors means that as you stretch the wall, that triggers an increased firing frequency of action potentials from these stretch receptors. And of course, what would stimulate, what would stretch the wall? Well, an increase in pressure. If you increase the, the pressure within the carotid arteries, you're gonna stretch the walls even ever so slightly but by stretching the walls, you deform these nerve endings in such a way that they elicit an action potential, many, many action potentials. Those action potentials will travel up through afferent nerves, initially the sinus nerve of herring, which then joins the glossopharyngeal nerve or the ninth cranial nerve, and that goes up to the medulla in the brainstem. And then on the Aortic arch itself, we have aortic arch or aortic sinus baroreceptors. These are also stretch receptors, very similar to what we see in the carotid sinus receptors. And these receptors, however, are innervated by a branch coming off of the vagal nerve. Now, I've already talked about the vagus and its efferent activity, but the vagus Two thirds or more of the vagus nerve is actually afferent fibers going up to the brain. You know, the vagus nerve is a very, very large nerve. And so this is joining now the afferent components of the vagus nerve and sending its information of these action potentials up to the medulla within the brain stem. Now let's look at a diagram representing what is regulating cardiovascular function within the medulla itself. Here are our receptors coming from the, I mean, here's our afferent um, nerve activity traffic coming from the carotid sinus, aortic sinus arch baroreceptors traveling up the glossopharyngeal and, and vagus nerves. These fibers will innervate the, 
a region called the nucleus tractus solitarius within the medulla. And so increased activity or firing of these receptors will stimulate the NTS to increase its activity. Well, the, N the NTS will project fibers to another region called the nucleus ambiguous, which contains vagal efferent neurons. So neurons for the vagus nerves are located here, and the NTS will stimulate their activity. And their activity then will decrease the heart rate. That's the primary effect of vagal activity on the heart, and also conduction velocity. The NTS will also project fibers to another region called, called the caudal ventral lateral medulla, and it stimulates that region. That nucleus then sends inhibitory fibers to another region within the medulla called the rostral ventral lateral medulla, and that's the region that contains the sympathetic neurons for the sympathetic efferents. So when the NTS fires at a higher frequency from increased um, receptor afferent stimulation, not only does it turn on the vagal effects onto the heart, but through the CVLM will inhibit sympathetic outflow to the heart. And by inhibiting sympathetic outflow, of the heart that would then tend to cause vasodilation, I mean, I mean, decrease heart rate contractility and dilation of the blood vessels. So sympathetics normally stimulate contraction of blood vessels and stimulates the heart. But now if the NTS is activated, you are removing that sympathetic activity. So the NTS, what it does, it's firing tonically inhibits or puts the brakes on sympathetic activity. So now if you suddenly were to have decreased traffic coming up to the NTS and decrease its firing, you would cause a disinhibition of the sympathetics, which would then cause sympathetic activation to the blood vessels and to the heart. And then finally, the hypothalamus plays a role in this too, because there are connections between these medullary regions and the hypothalamus and I talked about how discrete regions within the micro, within the hypothalamus can provide an integrated type of response that then controls um, these different regions within the medulla. So a key concept here is that baroreceptor firing tonically inhibits sympathetic outflow from the medulla and activates parasympathetic outflow. Now let's look at some of the characteristics of the baroreceptors themselves. And this would be an example of the carotid sinus baroreceptor, although they, the um, aortic arch receptors are very, very similar in how they behave. What I have plotted here is mean arterial pressure or carotid artery pressure, basically, versus an integrated receptor firing rate. Now, this is taken from experiments where one can isolate the carotid sinus experimentally in an anesthetized animal preparation and regulate the pressure within the sinus, the static pressure, and at the same time have recording electrodes placed on the sinus nerve of herring so you can record the actual potential activity coming off of the carotid sinus receptors. Now, in that experimental model, if you start off with a pressure of around 60 millimeters of mercury, these receptors are pretty quiescent. They're not firing. As you increase the pressure, you get more and more firing of these carotid sinus receptors. And as the pressure gets higher and higher, then the rate of activation of these receptors comes a little bit less. And it finally plateaus at somewhere around 170, 180 millimeters of mercury. So this is the response characteristics of these receptors to static pressure changes. Now, what I want you to notice here is that if you look at this, this red response curve here, the portion that, the, the, the point that has the greatest slope, I've drawn here as a black tangent to the point on that red curve that has the greatest slope. The greatest slope means that it has the maximal sensitivity, 
because of the steepness of that slope, very, very small changes in arterial pressure can have dramatic effects on the integrated receptor firing rate. And that happens to be the pressure that we're normally operating at. That's our normal mean arterial pressure, around 90, 95 millimeters of mercury. So these baroreceptors are designed to be exquisitely sensitive around your normal mean arterial pressure operating point. So any deviation from that, just by a millimeter of mercury or two, will cause significant changes to receptor firing, which is sending that information up to the brainstem and modulating autonomic outflow. It's also important to point out that these receptors, though, are not just static receptors, as I tried to uh, explain in my little in experimental model that, that was used to, to generate these data. But they're also responsive to pulsatility. So if you were to plot the, the uh, arterial pressure pulse here versus single receptor firing, and these were experiments that have been done, if you do that, you will find that as the blood pressure suddenly rises from its diastolic pressure up to its peak systolic pressure, during ventricular contraction and systole, you will find that there is a high frequency burst of these receptors. And then as the aortic pressure starts to fall back towards its diastolic pressure, they become more quiescent. So these receptors are sensitive to the rate of change in pressure. Therefore, these receptors are sensitive to changes in pulse pressure. Because if you have a higher pulse pressure with the same mean pressure, you're going to have a higher rate of pressure change if you have a higher, if you're going to a higher peak pressure from a lower diastolic pressure, the rate of increase has to be increased. And therefore, you're going to have an increased firing rate of these receptors. So increased pulse pressure, even at a given mean pressure, increases receptor firing, which influences autonomic outflow from the medulla. Well, that's what's shown in this dotted red line here. The dotted red line is showing what, what would happen if you suddenly reduced the pulse pressure. So if you're operating at a mean pressure here of 90 millimeters of mercury, but were to suddenly reduce the pulse pressure, but keep the mean pressure the same, draw a vertical line, you would have less firing. Well, if you have less firing of these receptors at that given mean pressure, that means you're going to get more sympathetic activation. And in fact, then both a fall in mean pressure and a fall in pulse pressure add together to stimulate sympathetic efferent activity in the body. And where does this come into play? Well, the best example is in circulatory shock. If a person has bled out a large volume of blood, they're now tachycardiac, they have low arterial pressure, and if you, if, you, if you just feel their radial pulse, their radial pulse is going to feel very weak. And if you, have a, a, if you measure their, their pressure, you're going to see that their, pulse, that their arterial pressure, pulse pressure, is also reduced. That reduction in pulse pressure, along with the reduction in mean arterial pressure, they are additive to enhance this baroreceptor reflex or sympathetic activation that occurs in response to hemorrhage. Uh, key concept then is that re baroreceptors respond to rapid, short-term changes in arterial pressure. They are rapidly adapting receptors. If a person is chronically hypertensive, for example, that does not mean that they have higher receptor firing of the baroreceptors because they're, they will adapt to that higher pressure. They actually reset at that higher pressure. So these baroreceptors are more responsive to sudden changes in arterial pressure in an attempt to bring back arterial pressure and to normalize it through a negative feedback mechanism. So let's, let's look at that. If you have a sudden fall in arterial pressure, let's say you're, you're lying down, you suddenly stand up. When you suddenly stand up, your cardiac output falls, and your cardiac output suddenly falls, your mean arterial pressure falls, and it decreases baroreceptor firing in the carotid sinus. Well, that will lead through the mechanisms we've already talked about, through the NTS and all those 
medullary centers, that will lead to a sympathetic activation and vagal inhibition. And together, sympathetic activation and vagal inhibition will lead to an increase in cardiac output and an increase in S. VR. Well, the increase in cardiac output may not be higher than it was before. It's still going to be lower, and we'll, we'll see that in just a moment, too. But it will stimulate, I should say, it will stimulate the cardiac output and certainly increase the SVR. And together, these will help to blunt the fall in pressure. And so even though you stand up and pressure might transiently fall, after a period of time, it's perfectly normal again, if everything is operating correctly. There's also what's called a central resetting of the baroreceptor reflex. And the example of this occurs, for example, during exercise. And what I have plotted here is a little different plot than what I showed you before. Before, we looked at carotid sinus nerve activity as a function of arterial pressure or carotid sinus pressure. So the curve was going up like this here. Okay. Now we're looking at sympathetic efferent nerve activity. And we do this in human studies by measuring um, uh, the sympathetic nerve activity, let's say the skeletal muscle. That's easy to do with recording electrodes. And then you measure the person's blood pressure. And then so you, you can relate sympathetic nerve activity, which is vasoconstrictor uh, response. You can relate that to changes in blood pressure. When you do that, you get a curve that looks like this here. In other words, the higher the carotid sinus pressure, the lower the sympathetic nerve activity, as we talked about earlier. At rest, we might be operating at this point here. Mean arterial pressure or carotid sinus pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury. And let's say that we suddenly uh, increase the mean arterial pressure now to uh, have about 115 or so here. If we do that to 115, that we see that there would be a fall in sympathetic efferent nerve activity, the barrel reflex. But you know, when you exercise, your blood pressure goes up. It might go up by the same amount. It might go up to 115 millimeters of mercury for the mean pressure from 90. It goes up, but you don't get a reduced sympathetic nerve activity. It's actually increased despite the increase in blood pressure. And that is because centrally within the medulla and within the hypothalamus and its connections with the medulla, we get a resetting of the baroreceptor reflex so that this whole curve shifts up and to the right such that when you exercise, even though your pressure is elevated, your sympathetic nerve, nerve activity is higher than it was at rest. And that can only occur because of a resetting that is occurring of the baroreceptors. And then you stop exercising, and this curve falls back now to the resting curve. So the baroreflex is very dynamic, and the body can modulate it depending upon its needs. Baroreceptor reflex function is altered by exercise, as I just talked about, by chronic hypertension, leads to resetting. I briefly mentioned that earlier. It also occurs in chronic heart failure, or as the question that was asked several minutes ago, arterial vascular disease. Because if the carotid arteries become, become stiffer with age and become calcified and you get you know, stiffness of these arteries, they don't stretch the receptors as well. And so the barrel reflex can be, be attenuated by that. We have other types of receptors now besides these arterial baroreceptors that I've already talked about. And some of these receptors are called cardiopulmonary receptors. And these cardiopulmonary receptors are located in the atria and at venal atrial junctions. And so that's where the vena cava come into the right atrium and where the pulmonary veins come into the left atrium. That's what I mean by venal atrial junctions. In general, these pulmonary recept cardiopulmonary receptors are innervated by vagal afferents that travel to the NTS and the hypothalamus. They respond to venous pressure changes because we're on, they're on the low pressure side. 
of the of the cardiovascular system. They're measuring left atrial pressure or right atrial pressure, basically, or the pressure right around those chambers. So their low pressure, their pressure, their sensors that are responding to low pressure changes and volume changes. And we say that they might be volume receptors because what changes venous pressure? Well, changes in blood volume will change venous pressure. And so if you have a change in venous in total blood volume of the body and venous volume increases, causes more stretch of these receptors and increased firing of, of these receptors. So this, that's why they're called also volume as well as low pressure receptors. These receptors generally reinforce the arterial barrel reflex. So when you suddenly stand upright, you will, as we've already talked about, unload the arterial barrel receptors, and I mean, what I mean by that is decrease the pressure within the private sinus, and that decreases their firing. You also, when you stand up, you will also affect the low pressure receptors because of the graft effects of gravity drops venous pressure, central venous pressure falls when, when you stand up. And so in both types of receptors, both the cardiopulmonary and the arterial receptors will show decreased firing, which will together enhance the sympathetic outflow. Now, there is a condition where, they, where the cardiopulmonary receptors oppose the arterial barrel reflex, and that is in heart failure. Uh, because in heart failure, yes, we can have a fall in arterial pressure, which would decrease carotid sinus firing, but at the same time, when you have heart failure, you get an increase in venous blood volume, both because blood backs up in the, you know, proximal to the failed heart, it's not pumping adequately, and in heart failure, you get, you get humoral changes that lead to an increase in blood volume and venous pressures. And so the cardiopulmonary receptors may be sensing a higher pressure in heart failure, but the arterial receptors may be sensing a lower pressure, so they'll kind of oppose each other here. These cardiopulmonary receptors um, appear to be the origin of what we call the Bainbridge reflex. We know in human studies, we know that a sudden increase in venous return to the right atrium leads to an increase in heart rate. Because when you suddenly increase the venous return to the right atrium, you will increase right atrial pressure and stretch of these receptors. And that sends up signals to the brain that then increases the heart rate, and that's called the Bainbridge reflex. And finally, there are receptors within the atria, particularly the right atria, a type of receptor that normally inhibits the release of arginine vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone from the pituitary gland. Vasopressin, besides affecting um, fluid balance within the kidney also is a drug that can cause vasoconstriction.